opening disclaimer, um, I was supposed to be here today with Melissa Conway from LUC. Um, unfortunately, Melissa couldn't be here in person today, mm -hmm. so it's just me. Um, and as a result, some of these words are not my own, so do bear with me just slightly um, as I try my best to um, get through this. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is historic landscape and how is it characterised? Um, so the European Landscape Convention um, was signed and ratified in 2006 and took effect from 2007. Um, it defines historic landscape as an area perceived by people who character, um, whose character is the result of action and interaction of human and natural factors. Um, concept is in harmony with this definition um, and treats landscape as an artefact which holds huge volumes of information documents many phases of uh, human interaction with places and looks at visibly historic um, and those that don't really. Um, so we're going to be looking at two HS2 examples that illustrate this and um, that you can see on this slide. Uh, one is a nice 17th century timber frame cottage which I'm informed is in rural Cheshire, Liz probably knows what it's called, um, and then the Ratcliffe on Store Power Station, Leicestershire, um, which some of you may have passed if you came up on the train or even not, I think you can see it from the M1. So um, it challenges, so what historic landscape does is challenges our perception of the landscape as timeless and natural, um, and it allows recognition and sets of the time depth um, that places hold, even those that look wholly modern. Um, so UK cities are a really good example of this. Um, they've evolved around the bones of earlier system constraints. Um, so this is captured by the creation of spatial data sets, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with, or many of you are hopefully familiar with, um, which we call characterizations, historic landscape characterization, um, and which map areas of shared evolution. Um, in England, the projects were undertaken, funded by um, Historic England and its predecessor, predecessor English Heritage, um, to achieve broadly a national coverage um, at this point. Um, it covers counties, metropolitan areas. Um, it took place over the course of about 20 years um, with similar, but not necessarily um, the same methodologies and terminologies. And that's part of what we're going to be covering today. There's also historic seascapes characterization, which we're not going to be looking at today, my project being a terrestrial project. Um, so why is it important? It's important in its own right. Um, but it also gives context um, to what we know about the distributions of existing assets, buried archaeological features, and um, surviving above ground features as well, and built heritage, which sits within those landscapes. So, where did it begin? So, we began on phase one. It was a kind of business as usual approach. Um, it was, what, more than about 10 years ago, Joe? More than 10 years ago now? Yeah, um, in phase one, environmental assessment, they approached it text-based, narrative text, uh, which incorporated some work on hedgerows and other uh, key landscape features as well. However, this did receive some challenge um, from Historic England. In response to this, uh, the phase 2A team undertook a review of the HS2 approach, uh, which resulted in a technical note in 2017. Um, and then which that set out a revised approach to how we were going to look at and assess historic landscape as part of our environmental statements to support the hybrid bills. Um, this approach led to the development of historic landscape character areas, so that's HCLAs, um, and these were created to act as assets in their own rights, but as very distinct kind of areas of character at the landscape <laughs> scale. Uh, they would be the focus for both assessing and managing effects, plus provide guidance on how we could manage change within those landscape areas. Um, it was also data that could be used by multiple topics. Um, so we know that, you know, for example, this type of work will feed into, feed into landscape and visual assessments through their landscape character appraisal. So they aimed to step away from site by site approach and look at a landscape scale. Um, reconcile their data sets um, whilst making use of the usual kind of desk-based resources that we're all familiar with. Bring the assessment and, uh, of effect and value in line with other heritage assets, so that there was a parity um, across, you know, built heritage, archaeology and now historic landscape of assessment. Um, and make the information more legible um, to everyone, not just specialists, but hopefully to everyone, 
through a combination of narrative and visuals, um, which incorporated all of the factors um, and then demonstrated our justifiable assessment, hopefully. And that's what you can see on the screen. It's the outcomes of that work. It was a PDF sheet um, that formed part of the environmental statement. And they covered a two kilometer study area for the whole of the 2A route. And so they have a map of the HCLA, which includes multiple historic um, landscape type areas. And you can see those listed down the side. Um, some characterizing photographs of the um, HCLA, a map of its general area, a narrative description, a assessment of the value of the asset. And you can see that that's also created um, visually as well as uh, textually. Um, discussion on the magnitude of impact, scale and effect, and the duration of the effects. And then we've got the very familiar significance of effect matrix here with the decision on whether it's a significant effect or not. And the approach, to, you know, the assessment approach was a fairly standard um, EIA uh, approach. I think that's everything. Yeah, and then, so this was the foundation um, from which we then continued on phase 2b. So, the task that we had was to robustly assess what scheme would do to the historic landscape um, along our route. Um, and at this point, when we started, the route was going from Crewe to Manchester and beyond, and then from Birmingham to Sheffield and Leeds beyond um, so it was it was quite a large area document the assessment um, and articulate the results in a way which could be really clearly understood um, the problem um, so which HLC because here an HLC exists where it's the national HLC um, but it wasn't well aligned to what the assessors were needed it's quite high resolution um, Melissa describes it as kind of looking at CFAX if anyone remembers that if you don't, ask your neighbour, someone with a beard, I'll probably know. Um, uh, yeah, and then, uh, lost my place now. Uh, but yeah, they weren't, and it wasn't really based in real, like it was really not based in real world boundaries. And we have 11 different HLCs, rural and urban. Um, and it's also worth noting as we move forward that, as I say, we have 11 um, different HLCs to deal with and if we'd only had um, the stretch from Crewe to Manchester as we have at the minute uh, we may well have taken a different approach it's all about context and assessing what's appropriate for your project in in the in the context of that project um, so um, the currency of the data was also an issue it's 15 over created over 15 years to span using different terminologies different Approaches, obviously thinking changes over a 15 year period about what you want to get out of these things. Um, it's not really a skill that is completely mainstream within the commercial uh, environment at the moment. Um, I can see Brendan nodding as well. Um, <laughs> so yeah, because most of us come from an archaeological background or a built heritage background. Um, not many of us come from a background where we're taught much about landscapes. Um, and so, ooh, oops. And so what we did, um, we got the specialist consultant, that was Mel, um, to come in with us at HS2 to review the data um, and provision us with some usable data um, and then provide us with training through guidance, seminars, worked examples and progressive review and assurance. No groans from the back. <laughs> so... Focusing on the data review and provision, um, we started with discounting the NHLC because it had a lack of resolution and it wasn't going to be of any use to us. So we threw that away, except we didn't throw it entirely away. We kept the terminology dictionary because the quality and transparency of this dictionary was of actual, was of great use. And then what Melissa did was um, take the various HLCs and match the wildly varying uh, types from those to the NHLC dictionary so that we then start began to develop a consistent terminology. Um, so yeah the typology was unaltered um, from the NHLC. So there were 913 HLC types in the original data which matched to 128 NH NHLC types and then uh, stuck onto the original HLC areas 
um, to create this, what we call the concorded data set. Um, and this could be used by the EIA team for assessment then. And the process is all documented in the, you know, the digital information, scheme information, the metadata, um, and yeah, they, and we can trace it back if we need to then. So um, to illustrate this process, um, taking an area near Loughborough, so that is the NHLC, um, and you see now what Melissa means by it's very grainy. Um, the gray area that you can make out is the um, East Midlands Airport, I think. And um, so keep your eyes on that as a point of reference. Um, so that's that. Then we had the three HLCs. And as you can see, this is a good example because you can see here that there's a really strong, looks like there's a really strong step in character change. Um, between the areas. But then once Melissa had concorded the data sets and mapped them onto the NHLC typology um, dictionary, you can see suddenly it all starts to make a bit more sense. And oddly enough, the landscape type doesn't immediately change just because you're stepping outside of, um, God, I don't know what county that is because of the county, because the county is an artificial political border it continues. And so particularly on this side, you can see that it, it suddenly brings the landscape uh, into much more sense. So that's what we were aiming to achieve. And then hopefully you'll be able to pick up real patterning in the historic landscape rather than any artificial patterns or artifacts. Okay. Five minutes. Right. So uh, we had the data um, and then we decided we needed to process it and this was an idea brought to us by our CDES who were the authors of the environmental statement. They wanted all of their data in one place, which why would they not? So we popped it into a database which was created by the ASIC and this allowed them to put in all of the analytical data um, and store it in one place. Um, it also had the ability to add in images and maps. Here you can see the um, the, the drop downs for doing the um, assessment of impact and the assessment of value. Um, so it's all the usual stuff you would do, sort of just writing it in an Excel or writing it in your Word, you know, um, table or whatever you want to do, or just in text form. But this is a bit more automated. And what that allowed us to do was to spit out these outputs pretty much automatically. Um, and again, you can see how they've come from those ones on 2A. We've got the map, we've got the location map, key characteristics, the description, uh, the asset value, magnitude of impact effect, and a commentary on how we have reached that assessment. So that's the justification of how we've reached that assessment. It's really concise, it's really intelligible, um, it divides up the route entirely into these landscape <laughs> scale areas, and it explains what matters about each of the areas. Um, Sometimes archaeological features would be discussed in these, but only if it's relevant to informing the historic landscape character, which is what you can see, what is visible, so not below the ground. Um, so this is a rural one, and then that's an urban one. Um, where's that from within shore? Okay. Um, again, it's the same thing, but uh, yeah, it just demonstrates how it works. So uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were integrating this data as well and not seeing it as a thing out on its own, away from everything else. Historic landscape is often treated that way. So we developed, we had the risk, a thing that we called the risk model. Um, they had it on phase one, they had it on 2A, and we kept that going. And we brought our historic landscape, our HCLAs, into this, what we call risk assessment. And essentially it's creating archeological character areas. So you use your archeology, span your built heritage, your historic landscape, your geophysics results, and you put it all together and you do, I guess, what we would call an assessment of potential in, in our terms. Um, and we presented this environmental statement as well. And it just allows us to draw all those things together and also allows us to then think about the archeology span in the context of the historic landscape and start to join the dots. Um, is a map of some of our risk model areas just for you to see how those subzones work um, in terms of dividing up the, the route. Um, you can see this in the detail. If you're interested, you can you can submit yeah subject yourself to the government government website. So that's what we did. Um, 
it was really good. It was really well received by Historic England, um, hugely welcomed, and we received some great praise from Historic England. Um, it very much demonstrates the success of what was undertaken in terms of almost taking HLC, so the HLC projects, up to the next step for use for applications um, in, in how we make use of it as professionals anyway. Um, and so you could have met Melissa's written here. With HS2, she's shown how she can bring order out of seeming HLC chaos. Um, and we're going to, um, and hopefully it will be used in future projects and we can use this to yeah, keep developing this model. Lessons learned. Control terms, yeah, uh, I think we talked about this at EAA in the last year as well, you know, common languages, controlled terms, really important um, for understanding for ourselves and also for those people who we've communicated to. Um, terms with definitions, make sure that we all know what we're talking about, that we're talking about the same thing when we're talking about it. Um, terminologies, and oh, they're only as good as the instructions they come with, so this is, she says, this has hampered a lot of HLC use because people didn't know how to use it. They didn't know how to apply that data within their assessments. Um, so, you know, training, guidance, find out what's going on. Uh, collaboration is key. We, yeah, couldn't have done this without Melissa, without Yasek, without the authorship teams all working together to make sense of this data and road test it, if you will. Um, so re don't reinvent the wheel. We have the data. We had the typologies, we just needed to bring them together to make them into a usable data set. Um, but do test drive it. So understanding how people are using that data, what they think of it, how it's going down. You know, we did have some bumps in the road as we were going along about understanding. We started off and we had some teeny tiny little HLCs which weren't really of any use to anyone and then did some training everyone start to get the idea a bit more we got the bigger ones that we needed for more usable scale and so yeah it, it is a process and collaboration and again but you know there we bumps so but you know the pilots are hopefully done now um, and I think you know it's really possible to articulate context in which the other more discrete assets sit through HLC and I think that's my point is that it's kind of it's the glue that kind of holds the historic environment together. You know, I think a lot of us are a bit, don't really know what to do with historic landscape in the past maybe, um, but I think it's gonna come more and more to the future, picking up on what Brendan said. You know, we're facing a lot of potential landscape change, both from climate change and from our reactions to climate change. And I think understanding our historic landscape and all of our assets and how they sit within it as a whole, taking a holistic view, is gonna be really important. And of course, the historic landscape is where people live their lives. It's maybe the easiest thing for them to begin to understand if we're talking about um, the thing about the value of heritage. Mm -hmm.